That's so weird. I would never go to library campus. library close at like 6.30 now, though. On a, on a Sunday? I you mean, still, a Saturday? Yeah, they used to be open from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m. Wow. On the weekends. Every day, in fact. And then, apparently, two weeks ago, they changed the hours and neglected to tell anyone, and now they close at 6.30 on weekends. Wait, the whole library or just Taylor Center? Taylor Center. Hmm. Why? The universe will return after these messages. I will explain to you. The miracles of Pretty sure you don't watch TV. Well, no, I don't watch TV. Then why are you watching TV? I don't know, I watch TV for socialist reasons. Just because I should have doesn't mean you should start a bad habit, Andrew. Well, yeah, I thought this was your house. This is not my house. Well, whose house is it? I don't know. It was, it was, I mean, it seemed nice enough when I broke in. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's been a really nice place. Do you, you uh, ever hear the story about the the guy that uh, that reminds me of a joke that he like has one of those Indian scammer guys call him up and like trying to work him through how to fix his computer and yeah. he's like uh, yeah the, yeah I I'm actually I just broke into this house and I'm trying to trying to uh, uh, pick up the computer but if you're saying if it's broken if it's broken I don't I don't want to get a broken one he's like should I not get this one. And the scammer's just, like, flabbergasted that he's talking to a guy that's stealing the guy's computer, forgetting the fact that he's trying to steal the guy's money. <laughs> that was the best ever! <laughs> yeah, that, that, I, I would almost pay for, uh, for that transcript. That one was really funny. It was on YouTube someplace. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this kind of sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, the scammers can be, can be, uh, interesting to, uh, talk to and to hear stories mm-hmm. of... Well, hmm, I probably should look up podcasts for those. There you go. That'd give you something to do. That way you don't just have to st- sit here looking at a blank screen. Wait, like, I thought we were actually watching this podcasting channel or something. I don't know. I thought it was. I mean, some of it sounded familiar. It's uh, something 10151? What's that? I don't know. Probably something really weird and out there. Probably a whole bunch of nerds. Probably. Wait, aren't we supposed to do a podcast? Uh. Crap, 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 crap. Okay, okay, come on. Turn on. Alright, uh. What is it? How do I do these things? Oh, wait. This is Control Structure, episode 151, for January 29th, 2019, coming to you live from the pie hole. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash CS151 to see them. I am your host, Andrew Bailey, and with me, like usual, is Stephen Orvis. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Steve. It's been a while. It has been. Yeah, like, um... There is this, uh, there's Thanksgiving, I went to Africa for a little bit, then there's Christmas, and there's New Year's, there was, like, a whole bunch of yelling at some point. Um, oh yeah, so for New Year's, uh, Zach, Rachel, and, uh, Chris came over. That would be New- quite the time. Yes. Um, so, you know, I did my grilling, uh, you know, did my casserole, which, uh, Zach completely stuffed his face on and spent about half an hour in my bathroom. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, uh, you know, midnight finally came around. Uh, Rachel suggested something about, I was like, man, I wish I could, uh, smash, like, cake in your face or something. So, I r- just remembered that, uh, Chris had brought over some cupcakes, <laughs> so I smashed a cupcake into Zach's face. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So, yeah, good times. Raspberry? 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 Raspberry! You try to keep it down for your neighbor. Uh, I It's actually, his turn. <laughs> yeah, um, he, let's see. He hasn't really been playing video games, like, every single night, but some nights he does. You, you, you're tracking his, his uh, addiction of, of gaming. I don't know. He might not do it here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I see. So, uh, the Raspberry Pi Model 3A Plus has been released. 
So this is kind of the stripped down version, mm -hmm. kind of like the Model A was to the Model B originally. I feel like they're really killing the model names. Like they're just like stretching as much life out of them as they can. They just add one symbol to the end, kind of like a password. It's like 30 <laughs> days, have to change your password again. Oh, or is that another letter to the end here? So uh, this pretty much has all of the computational power as the 3B does. Uh, so it has, you know, the 1.4 gigahertz quad core 64 bit, uh, 512 megs of RAM, uh, wireless, uh, you know, like Wi Fi, uh, no Ethernet port, one USB port. So I believe the RAM was cut in half from the full Pi version. Uh, probably. Yeah, because they, they have a guy. The other article mentions that. I was thinking about it though, this one is not too unlike the first original Pies and we were so thought they were so neat and it has Wi-Fi which is still a really good upgrade actually and you can always plug in a Ethernet USB thing if you wanted to. Yeah. So And it's twenty five dollars too, they knocked ten dollars off the price. So that's not bad. Well, that's just like the first model A was. Okay. I couldn't remember what they were because I thought that everything was thirty five at first. Uh yeah, the smaller one was uh, 25. Okay. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know what was probably even cheaper? The Zero. Well, there's the Zero. There's also the Compute module, which I never really understood, like, why? Because this thing essentially plugs into something that looks like a RAM slot. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Model 3 Compute module uh, has been, you know, released, published, available for order, whatever. Um, so it essentially just has the processor, RAM, and, like, that's it, pretty much. Um, it can also have, uh, like, its own flash memory, like, right on the board. Mm -hmm. So you don't need, like, a SD card or anything. Um, so, like, apparently these are used in industrial applications, so you want to have a gigantic cluster of pies? Uh, sort of, I guess. So, uh, and now for this episode's LOL Apple. <laughs> Let me have not had one of these in a while. Uh, so, uh, someone on Reddit uh, has discovered that an MRI, when it is being used, uh, discharges a small amount of helium such that it pretty much freezes all iPhones in the area. Uh, apparently this is because it has like this little sensor inside that is dependent upon the composition of the air such that a little bit of helium completely throws it off. This is like Apple's bid against global warming or something. <laughs> <laughs> when you make too much smog, it all shuts down. <laughs> uh, maybe? But like we're talking on like a molecular yeah. molecular level here. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, another thing is if your MRI leaks helium, you should probably get that checked out. I just wanted to know if everyone was walking around the office talking in a funny voice. <laughs> Apparently it doesn't really take quite that much, uh, helium to, uh, do that to the phones. Uh, but yeah, you pretty much need a significant amount of helium f to affect voices. I think he said that in his test he used just a balloon of helium was all it took to lock it up in like how many minutes was it? Yeah, was like it eight 12? and a half. Okay. Uh, and then he tried he you know essentially you know put it into a bag. Uh, then he put uh, another time he just put a, just a little bit in and it took twelve minutes for it to lock up. Uh, but apparently uh, this really doesn't affect any other brand of phone. And if you go even older uh, iPhones, they're not affected either. Apple tax. Indeed. So, uh, <clears throat> another show, another vul vulnerability. Uh, symmetrical multi-threading uh, is considered uh, vulnerable. So, like, you know, hyper-threading and, you know, like, the whole idea of, you know, one processor acting as two. Uh -huh. um, apparently that's been exploited. Uh, through something called port smash, um, <clears throat> which this is this uh, this happened like a few months ago, and like it was like even for me, it's pretty complicated. That uh, like the actual execution units that do the work 
mm-hmm. uh, inside the CPU. Um, apparently, there's you can put code such that like it knows which ones are being used to extract data out of them. So the code that's running knows which one it's running on is the idea. Yeah, versus like the other uh, thread that it's being uh-huh. shared with. Gotcha. So you know this you know obviously has uh, some pretty tough complications for virtualization uh so like when you have several you know several separate systems running on a single cpu that you know might not be aware that something else might be running mm-hmm. on it you know if you happen to be encrypting your uh, web traffic and passwords and that it's okay if everyone knows that yeah they'll all be dumped anyway uh self encrypting drives are considered vulnerable um so, you know, these, uh, you know, SSDs, they're really fast, uh, and, like, apparently they also have, uh, I think they're SPI interfaces or something, um, that apparently through those you can extract the encryption key used to encrypt the drive media, like, right off the drive, you don't need to know the password to it or anything. Uh, you just need to, you know, connect it up and do a few uh, commands, generally sort of specific to the model of drive you're trying to attack. And, you know, suddenly there's the key. My best part was some of the drives, they pointed out that they ha- typically have a master password in them that is found in the owner's manual. And with the master password, you can then acquire the password the user set. And I thought that kind of reminded me of Microsoft Bob offering after three attempts, would you like me to tell you your password? <laughs> it seems you forgot it. <laughs> so, it appears that they uh, tested s- seven drives, um, which, this is huge, because like these Opal standard drives, like they're supposed to, you know, like have that key locked away that it's not supposed to be, you know, readable or anything. Uh, you only have commands to uh, change it, really. You doesn't. You can't really tell what it's been changed to in theory, but um, according to this, well, you probably could. Uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Marvel Avastar uh, Wi-Fi modules are considered vulnerable as well. Uh, in a pretty, uh, well, I wouldn't want to say in what depth. Uh, yeah, you could say so. So, due to like all these uh, structures in the embedded operating system running on this Wi-Fi chip, uh, you can essentially send a malformed Wi-Fi packet and wait for the uh, Wi-Fi module to rescan all the Wi-Fi networks in range, and it will execute this malicious payload. Which is a pretty interesting attack. So, and it's essentially a bunch of pointer fiddling. So, um, yeah, good job with that. Oh, something that you might be interested in. The U.S. Library of Congress says now you can fix your John Deere tractor. So, let's see, you're not actually using your farm right now, right? We're planting trees and having birthing animals. Okay, uh, are you actually planting anything? a garden but that's not what you're asking okay such that you would need a tractor for it well we could use a tractor for it we did use the neighbor's tractor last year to plow the garden (laughs) okay if you need to use a tractor to plow the garden i don't think it's a garden anymore (laughs) i don't know that's the only kind of garden i ever had (laughs) Yeah, that's called a field, okay? (laughs) It's just because I live someplace different than you and everything's bigger up there. (laughs) Oh, so you're in Texas now. (laughs) No, we have bigger coyotes than Texas. (laughs) Eastern coyotes are bigger because they're mixed with timber wolves. Coyotes out west are not. Eastern coyotes are bigger. Well, uh, side note, apparently 5,000 of them live in Chicago. (laughs) <laughs> I actually, my one friend, he's from Chicago in college, and that's where he said he, there's one place to go birding at. He was like, a bunch of coyotes live back there, so I believe it. Wow. That, so that's not just an urban legend, then. Where he went, there's coyotes. <laughs> uh, so, um, 
Who would have thought that you would have to have permission from the Library of Congress to fix your John Deere tractor? Uh, getting, uh, re-railing this conversation, if you will. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, you know, the onboard computer has some copy protection embedded in that, and tampering with that would be a violation of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, so you couldn't actually do anything with that or even fix the tractor. So, uh, so for a while there, there's some rogue farmers buying software from some guy overseas and yes. undercover fixing their tractors. <laughs> Because uh, waiting a few weeks for someone to come by and fix it is mm -hmm. kind of unacceptable when you need to harvest right now. <sighs> so uh, in uh, another copyright issue thing, so it turns out that the wearer of a tattoo doesn't actually own the tattoo or at least the copyright to it. Uh, the artist that made the tattoo does, which, I mean, it's kind of weird, but okay. It's not really an issue unless you're, say, an athlete who uh, whose likeness is put into a video game. Uh, because, you know, if, like, your fans, you know, see a representation of, say, LeBron James in a video game, that representation probably should have the tattoos that LeBron has. Otherwise, it's, like, not really not LeBron really in, in the video uh, game. I think that's one of the weird cases that could use adjusted... It's like it's free advertising. The, the article it mentioned a guy with a tattoo who was asked by yeah. a company. He's like, I just wouldn't even thought you'd need to ask. Is like, of course, it's better business. So it turns out that uh, Mr. James's uh, tattoo artist is going after, uh, I think it's EA, uh, mm. for you know the tattoos in the game. <laughs> Another form of patent trolls, probably. So, yeah, that's a pretty complicated thing. You know? Uh-huh. I mean, you'd think that since it was on you, you would own it. But, okay, apparently not. So, um, our favorite search engine, DuckDuckGo, um, up until recently did not actually... Didn't, Sorry. <laughs> did not actually own uh, Duck.com. But uh, as of, uh, let's see, about a month and a half ago... It does now. So ducks.com, which duck is go, huh? which is pretty neat. And that's I was surprised that Google. Uh, the sounds like handed it over to them. Yeah. So, uh, so good job, Google. Once, yeah. Once upon a time, there is this company called Onto Technologies. Uh, it did like a whole bunch of video codec work. Uh, so Google bought them and made uh, was it WebM. Uh, was it because uh, of their... It's essentially like the open video standard. Uh, so uh, through them, uh, Google owned Duck.com. So now uh, apparently this was pointed out at some point. <laughs> so, you know, Google's like, okay, fine, here you go. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that we really, you know, it's not like exactly a cash duck or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Cash duck. Oh. Uh, so, uh, you know how I run a, a Ryzen CPU mm -hmm. these days? So, the Ryzen 2000 series was, you know, fairly good. You know, kind of an optimization of what they were going for. Uh, but now the Ryzen 3000 series, which is the second generation Zen architecture that they're, you know, using here, uh, is has been announced. And some details are coming are uh, coming out. Uh, so AMD had been, you know, talking about their uh, Epic uh, server chips, uh, which essentially has like, you know, like three or not three, more like eight little CPU dies. Oh yes. And a larger die on there to just do the I/O. Uh, so the Ryzen uh, chips, sort of based off of that, have the I/O die and only one CPU core on it. Oh, interesting. So that's acknowledging the fact that your I.O. is not as often as all the other stuff you're doing. So, uh, hopefully this will, uh, you know, how should I say this, not increase uh, latency all that much. Yeah. So, uh, and there's even a picture of the uh, the chip itself 
Uh, it looks like there's, you know, plenty enough space for maybe another CPU mm -hmm. uh, die in there or maybe like a graphics die in there. See, the thing is most people are just going to be interfacing with one hard drive most of the time anyways. So it's like... Hard drives. In your RAM and stuff. But it's like <laughs> your IO, it does make sense. It's interesting. So uh, apparently uh, they're now, they now have PCIe 4.0 on there. Um, like the same amount of lanes and everything. Mm. Uh, so yeah, and also speculation about what uh, that what MP space spot is for. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, that should be out later this year. So you know how Google kills products. Yeah, I'm waiting for Gmail to go out of beta so they can kill it. Or did it already go out of beta? Yeah, it went out of beta oh, okay. like uh, I don't know more than five years ago, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yeah. Um, you know, just it goes wait. out of beta, lives for a while, then it dies. That's the life cycle. Yeah. Waiting for the, uh, you know, the axe to drop on that. Uh, but uh, for a while there, they were, like, thinking about using Inbox or something. Yeah. Uh, but it looks like the next one, or at least the next big thing in line, is Hangouts. Uh, so... Google has announced the uh, phase-out for G Suite users, like the corporate uh, account holders. Now, this one's a bit fuzzy for me because it seems more like uh, sometimes they talk more in reference to the app and just saying that there's alternatives. Because in one sense, like, Hangouts has come all the way from G Talk from yeah. years on back. So it's almost that like was the awesome. service is still there i don't know if it actually is or not but i was getting that impression and it's just more the apps they're connecting to it so uh so the impact for people who do not use g suite uh you know will still use classic hangouts and continue to support the consumer use of classic hangouts and expect to transition uh, customers to free chat and meet uh following the transition of the g suite customers free chat and meet uh, a more specific timeline will be communicated at a later date. So, yeah. Good job, Google. Killing everything again. Uh, so, Bungie divorces from Activision and takes back its destiny. Which, uh, so, you know who uh, Bungie is, right? The game no. developers? Uh, have you ever heard of Halo? Yes. Okay. So, Bungie was, were the original people that made Halo. Oh, okay. So, and, you know, that was on Xbox as a Microsoft mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so Bungie uh, gained independence from uh, Microsoft, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago now. Hmm. Uh, and they pretty much turned right around and signed a deal with Activision. Uh, like, uh, let's see, I think at this point they're the, yeah, they are like the largest third-party uh, video game publisher, uh, which... You know, kind of scratched my head, and, you know, I was like, okay, well, Microsoft, like, actually wasn't too bad. Like, the gaming ecosystem, like, they, they really, they're really good to their game ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, Activision, worse, let's just say. Um, so, they signed a 10-deal, four-game contract with them. So, they made Destiny, and they've made uh, now Destiny 2, and people are starting to get angry over the... Uh, like the amount of monetization, let's just say, uh, the ways that the game wants you to spend money on the game, uh, despite game you purchases. having already, despite you having already bought the game, it wants you to spend a little bit more. It's okay, you have a lot of money. Uh, so uh, f I'm not exactly sure. Maybe this further on it tells it might say how Bungie actually got this money to break that contract. And take Destiny with them. Oh, that's how they did it? Yes. Oh, interesting. So Bungie is now like a free agent now. So that's why they were pushing it, because they weren't getting... They already got their money for the game, and so now they're using the in-game purchases to scrape the extra off the top. So, uh -huh. but but everyone thinks uh, like all that money-making business was because Activision was forcing them to put that in. Hmm. So maybe now... That'll ease up, maybe completely go away. Um, so, like, it was eight years into their contract. Why did they break it with only two years to go? I'm not sure. Mm. Like, 
once I thought it was better for them financially. Yeah, it, you know, at this point, you know, it was like, why didn't you just stick with it? I mean, you know, if it was just, it must have been really so bad that they broke the contract like this soon to the end. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah, and of course, after this, uh, Activision stock pretty much plummeted. <laughs> It's about half of what it was. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> um, pretty much, uh, let's see, EA, that other game company, yeah. uh, their stock is way down, uh, along with people like NVIDIA, Intel. <laughs> All the gaming stuff done right now. Well, yeah. Bitcoin tanks, so of course the game. Yeah, like pretty much. Graphics cards companies. Pretty though. much all the tech stocks are yeah. down. <laughs> so now it's your time to buy. Uh, so, Spatial OS. Uh, I never really heard of it until uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, is a cloud uh, platform for multiplayer games. So it's essentially like you know, like Amazon Web Services, but for games. So like you can spin up you know as many you know like dedicated servers or whatever for you know if if you were making a game mm-hmm. you could you know you know scale up or down as you yeah. as you would need. Uh, so Unity. Uh, that one engine that powers like a lot of you know sort of low end uh-huh. slash independent games uh, has changed its license such that it forbids managed services running on cloud infrastructure, which would essentially target spatial OS. Hmm. Uh, so pretty much the day after this, Epic Games, uh, the people behind you know the Unreal Engine. Uh, teams up with uh, was it yeah improbable uh, the people who made Spatial OS uh, to establish a twenty five million dollar fund to help developers move to more open engines uh, in other words Unreal Engine four hmm. uh, so I've also heard that uh, there might have been some clarification that Unity really didn't mean that Spatial OS you know wasn't a thing on there, you know, uh, on Unity anymore. Apparently they may have been, like, a little mistaken. That's kind of weird. It's almost, so they're paying people now to drop their engine and go yeah. elsewhere because they don't want to be used. Well, uh, Epic and Improbable did that. And then uh, Unity apparently is like, oh, we're sorry, we really didn't mean it. Hmm. Oh, okay, I, I see what you're saying now. Okay, yeah. So... Yeah, so I tried looking at the Disney's practical guided path tracing, but apparently the video just plays as soon as you click the link. <laughs> so, uh, see, I think it was probably in our last uh, video, or maybe the video, or last video, last podcast, last episode, uh, maybe the one before that, where we talked about the NVIDIA GT, or not GTX, RTX 2000 cards. Uh, these cards have ray tracing features in them. So, uh, you know, the selection of games that, you know, have, have these features, you know, it's like, yeah, they look a little bit better. They have, you know, pretty reflections, light that's maybe a little bit fancier, but like nothing on the class of a killer app, let's just say. Uh, but Quake 2 certainly looks good. Uh, yes, Quake 2... You know, one of the games made, you know, back in the late 90s that sort of looks like poop-smeared origami otherwise. Um, but yeah, the lighting is really awesome uh, when it's ray-traced. Oh, so they converted it. Yeah. Is that the one that's open source or it became open source or something so that people can do well, things with it? Or is that, am I thinking of a different one? Thinking of a different what? Different game. Um, Quake 2 is an id game. So yes, they are. It is open source. Okay. So yeah, as you can see in the uh, example videos here, uh, yeah, it's pretty shiny. Mm. So uh, one, you know, one of the last things, like the last, the last, one of the last big leaps that you know I figured you know would happen in you know uh, real time uh, graphics and gameplay or game video game graphics. Uh, was lighting. And it turns out I may have been right on that. So, I mean, it looks like Quake 2 is a very red-ish game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not sure if the if everything was supposed to, you know, have like a sort of like a glossy color on it. Or, or if that's the glossy reflections. The conversion did that. Yeah. But, 
It, it doesn't quite look like a hall of mirrors. Yeah, it's not that bad. But you can see, like, the fireballs and stuff. It lights up, like, the, the background behind it and stuff. Yeah. Whee! Let's do that again. Whee! You can see the shadow of that box over there. Yeah. Is that? So I guess that would be one of the features, right? Yeah. Uh, with ray tracing, shadows just happen. <laughs> so... So, speaking about uh, video games, the Stanley Parable. We haven't talked about that in a while. Uh, the St Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe Edition uh, has been announced. Uh, this kind of snuck up on me uh, that it didn't what didn't really appear until like all the lists of video games that people were looking forward to. And I'm like, wait, the Stanley Parable. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm not sure if. Uh, like, it'll automatically upgrade the people who, uh, you know, have the original one or not. Oh, that's true. They might. I like how it says uh, Ultra Deluxe. So it's not just like the Deluxe. The Ultra Deluxe. Yes. Uh, which is, uh, you know, I think they did this because they're going to put it on consoles. And they hope to make lots and lots of money out of it. Enough for a third swimming pool. Yes. And they were very open about this goal, too. Yes. So, now that it's 2019, uh, you know what it's time for? What's that? It is time uh, for Ian Buck to uh, play the Stanley Parable. He because hasn't played it? Because it's been five years since he played it last, and he, wants, he wanted to get that achievement where you don't play the game for five years, oh. and he wanted to do it honestly. And, okay. And I have checked the Steam achievements. He has not yet done that. Ha <laughs> ha. So get on that, Buckface. That's funny. Uh, so, Patreon. Uh, I think we might have mentioned that in passing here and there. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar, Patreon is a website where uh, it's sort of like Kickstarter, but more of, a, of an ongoing basis, uh, where people come by and say, I will support you for like $1 a month, $10 a month, How? how much ever, um, to support you in what you do. Uh, usually this is like for people on YouTube, uh, people who stream games, people who, you know, do all sorts of stuff on an ongoing basis that people kind of like and, you know, would want to, you know, financially support this person, you know, like on an ongoing basis. Uh, so uh, Patreon uh, uh, had uh, certain terms of use. Uh, and now people are angry uh, at Patreon for completely disregarding said terms of use. Specifically, they stated that Patreon would only take action against users for content on Patreon. Specifically. Like, their CEO uh, you know, has an entire video, uh, or rather, he came onto someone else's show mm -hmm. and like specifically stated time and time again it was for only for things on Patreon. Oh, so it's not just the hidden clause in the user service agreement. It's way out there. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, once upon a time they banned someone for something that didn't happen on Patreon. And it was on a video stream on a channel that wasn't even his. So uh, with this... Uh, you know, people rightfully, you know, started to get a little angry. Uh, Q Boycott and Exodus. So, like, a lot of, you know, pretty high up important people on Patreon have closed their accounts. Uh, and lots of other people who supported them have already left. So, uh, full disclosure of this, uh, the Nexus.tv has a Patreon account, but we here at the Nexus.tv East do not and have not received funds from it. Not that we really want to, but if we woke up one day and decided that we shouldn't be on Patreon anymore, we know exactly what to do, but we won't do that because we're not a bunch of n And yes, I will beep that out. Uh, and now for a Kickstarter update. Uh, the Northerner, the Northerner Symphony, uh, see, back when Chris was on the show, we, uh, we were kind of uh, interested in this uh, because it's the the composer behind the Elder Scrolls and, uh, let's see, also Supreme Commander. Uh, he uh, decided to go on Kickstarter and uh, kickstart Symphony, uh, which, at least at the time, was the first one. 
that uh, was ever on there. Did you do this? This was like a long time ago you signed up for it? Yes. Okay, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, this is like 2012, 2013-ish. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, so they finally renounced, announced release dates. Uh, the Northerner, The Moon, and The Night Sky will release on the Spring Equinox, uh, which is on March 20th, uh, less than two months away, uh, as a digital download-only album to all backers. And on the Winter Solstice, uh, December 21st, uh, the Northerner Symphony will be released as a download, and all rewards will begin shipments uh, to the backers approximately on the 15th. It's a lot of years later. <laughs> yes, so it's it's great that this is uh you know finally you know wrapping up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh it was I think it was 2 maybe 3 years ago that they released uh uh was it uh, the Northerner Diaries which apparently was uh you know pieces that did not make it into you know the final oh interesting. So uh hopefully there you know maybe there have not been any other pieces that didn't release and they've and he's just been polish, polishing it to a mirror shine uh so yeah uh and yes the uh the diaries album is a very uh pleasant listening uh for winter so I've been listening to that a lot because yeah. it's winter now <laughs> <laughs> uh and also uh this is perhaps maybe a little bit late uh, Planet X3. Uh, so, uh, let's see. This is from uh, the 8-Bit Guy uh, YouTuber. YouTuber. Uh, so, he's made, a, I guess, a, now a series of real-time strategy games for older computers. Uh, the first one, I think, was like for a VIC-20. Mm. Uh, the second one uh, was for a Commodore 64. Uh, and now he's done one for uh, DOS computers. Like really early DOS, like actual DOS, That's like neat. like the first uh, IBM was a fifty one fifty PC, nice. Uh, with like uh, uh, was it uh, yeah like four color graphics CGA it's, graphics. He's got a hundred and thirteen thousand dollars out of the thirty thousand so, dollars. So yeah, <laughs> graphics that look like this. Yes. Uh, so he uh, you know he went way over. Uh, what he was asking for, uh, and he's now you know finished that. And uh, in fact, on Christmas Eve, he sent out the uh, the the digital version, mm-hmm. uh, made that available, and I have loaded that onto Twentieth Century, and it is amazing. There you go. You could have got a printed manual and a floppy disk with it. Uh, I have my own floppy disks, thank you. Nice. <laughs> in fact, I'm not sure if I still have it down here or not. I love the sound they make when you run them. Uh, let's see. Uh, I might have put it back upstairs, but yeah. <laughs> I uh, actually uh, pulled out one of my floppy disks and put it on there, but, you know, who really needs floppies when you have Ethernet? <laughs> and FTP. There you go. So, yeah, it's it's pretty fun. It, uh, you know, uses the PC speaker for sound effects. Uh and uh MIDI for the music. Very nice. Yes. So uh look for a blog post on my blog someday. I really haven't put anything on there since like before Thanksgiving. And I've finished well two games since then. I just need to, you know, get the motivation to write up a blog post that, you know, Mm, probably sucks, but still. <laughs> you make content. Yes. So, uh, yeah, that seems to be about it. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, this week, uh, everyone in the office is going out to Kansas City, except for me. But that's so by my you... own choice. Oh, okay. Uh, so, I'm going to be sitting in an empty office. That's what I was going to ask you. You're going to sit there in your cubicle by yourself. <laughs> cubicle? Oh, okay. what cubicle? Your open, open range space. Yes. Um, let's see. Since the last podcast, the senior guy on my team has left. Hmm. So, like, uh, out of everyone who you know works with me, I've been there the longest. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I have some big shoes to fill. There you go. So, uh, and everyone else is you know buzzing off to Kansas City. Hmm. It's like I really don't want to go to Kansas City in the winter. 
Oh, is it really cold out there in the winter? Well, it's about as cold as it is here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, going to be an interesting time. <laughs> Just going to be me and, you mm-hmm. know, the skeleton crew. Uh, so, uh, oh, yeah. So, you know how I, I think I'm, maybe I told you this. The uh, company that split the uh, office space with us. Yes. Uh, they have finally moved out. Oh, so it's one big open space now? Uh, well, let's see. About Up until about a month, yeah, they moved out in the middle of December. Mm-hmm. Short, I think it was maybe a week or two after I got back from Africa, like just before Christmas. Uh, so I'm like, okay, Steve, can we like move around in here? Like any, any place we want? And uh, he's like, well, let me check with, uh, you know, one of the, I think it was like one of the office managers out in KC, mm-hmm. apparently. So... Like, apparently, I was just going to move and, like, you know, kind of like the uh, ask, you know, it's better to, it's easier to ask forgiveness uh-huh. than permission. Uh, and as soon as I was walking out that day, he's like, hey, uh, so here's the plan. Uh, all the UI guys are going in that room. You and Brendan are staying, you know, in that room. And oh, so you didn't get to move? Well, I didn't have to. Oh, okay, I see. Uh, because, you know... Uh, you know, even even up until like one of his last days, uh, Brendan was usually working from home. Mm, okay. So I generally had the place all to myself oh, anyway. Okay. I see. So uh, the thing about the UI guys is that they talk to each other a lot. <laughs> so you know, half the times I had my headphones on, I might not have been listening to anything. Mm. So it's <laughs> Just don't talk to me. I'm working. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> That's so. funny. But, uh, yeah, I'll have the place all to myself. There you so, go. Uh, yep, and I'm keep on grilling. So, uh, anything interesting happened to you? Well, I've been making pork. <laughs> we had baby pigs last night. <laughs> One of them made it. <laughs> and by uh, had baby pigs, you mean uh, baby pigs were born. Correct. Okay. Yes. And then we... Actually, a few weeks before that, even, we, we bought two piglets from a guy up the road. So we have three pigs in the house right now. And it still looks like a pig pen, just like before. <laughs> <laughs> so Now we've been cleaning it up, doing a lot of work on it to make it a little better. In the basement, actually, like, when you flip the switch and go down the basement, like, things actually light up somewhat now, instead of still looking like a cave down there. I mean, it's still a cave, but it's less of a cave. <laughs> things like that. So, um, let's see, it was, I think it was the first weekend after New Year's, uh, I now have another car. Oh, nice. Yeah, uh, a Honda Accord. Okay. Uh, which, uh, I kind of like because my first car was also a Honda Accord. Okay, I couldn't think what you had, but I think my pastor had had one, uh, one of the Hondas, and he liked it, and it did good gas mileage and stuff. Yeah, so. and uh, it also feels like a go-kart. <laughs> Lit to the ground, small. And... Yeah, and uh, also good acceleration. Oh, okay, there you go. So. <laughs> That's what my sister has. It was mom's car, she loves it. She drives it like a police car. <laughs> so, um, the week after that... I told my landlord, yeah, go ahead and, you know, renew my lease for another year. Mm-hmm. Uh, the week after that, I got pre-qualified for a mortgage. Oh, so you're buying a house. Uh, maybe. Oh, pre-qualified. I gotcha. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so, yeah, I've been looking around at houses, but, you know, nothing yet. Okay. So. It takes a long time to look sometimes. Well, I was looking for years. So. Well, like, in, in winter, uh, slim pickings. Mm. Uh, spring, spring, be cheaper though in the winter time too. That's what well, it looks like. I think, I think at my, at my point, you know, all the houses that are still for sale are the ones that may no be priced wanted. too expensive. Oh, okay, I see. <laughs> or the ones no one wanted. <laughs> we can't get rid of this place. The basement's falling in. <laughs> the roof's bad. Well. Well, no, it's generally the roofs have been good. Okay. Uh, the first place uh, looked like they were having water issues, drainage issues in the one corner, and the downstairs bathroom was a wreck. Ah, uh, okay. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, like, you know how I said that I kind of liked my neighborhood, and uh -huh. maybe I'm, you know, could see myself moving down the street, you know, buying a house down the street. There's a house for sale down the street. Well, there you go. <laughs> um, but it doesn't have a garage. Hmm. Garages uh, are nice. Yes. So, uh... You could, yeah. you could get a big stack of firewood and build yourself a cordwood garage. There's a building style where you literally stack the wood like it's a stack of firewood, but you put mortar between the wood. And it's called a log it. cabin. Well, it's like a log cabin, but it's a sideways log cabin. It's the ends of the log cabin, like... Maybe. Pretty sure we're doing fringing now. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess we can go ahead and start doing that again. So, um... I guess that's it, so watch for cars. Okay. know exactly what to do, but we won't do that because we're not a bunch of ninjas. And yes, I will beep that out.